Welcome to class number six. This is the final class of our introduction to derivatives. And in this class, we're going to learn about a number of new derivatives, at least new to us. We'll be learning about swaps and credit derivatives, which are both very important derivatives in the marketplace. Um, we'll be looking at chapters 15 and 17 of your textbook. And the first thing we're going to do is just have a bit of a background primer on interest rates. Now, obviously, these are not derivatives, but in order to understand uh, fixed income derivatives, it's important for us, firstly, to define a few terms and make sure everyone is uh, up to speed with what we're talking about with regard to interest rates and the different rates that exist and the type of borrowing and lending that, that occurs in the marketplace. So, Interest rates factor into nearly all derivatives. And as you've seen up until now, all of our futures, forwards, uh, options, exotic options, everything has an interest rate embedded in it somewhere in its pricing. Um, interest rates also factor into all economic decisions. So any business out there, whether they're thinking of expanding or contracting or launching a new product, they usually are going to take the rate of interest that they can borrow at or invest at into account in deciding whether it makes sense to, uh, to pursue that decision. Um, Interest rates are fundamental to finance, they're a fundamental concept in finance, because almost the most basic formula we have in finance is the idea of discounting future cash flows, the idea that a dollar in a year's time is not worth a dollar today, that there's, there's a, an interest rate that has to be paid on that in order to make them equal. Um, applicable rates typically depend on things like the credit risk of borrowers. So the riskier a loan is usually the higher you'd expect the interest rate to be. And the lower the risk is, the lower the interest rate would be. And that just ties into another basic concept of finance, which is the, the concept of risk and return. And that an investor usually, in order to take additional risk, should have a higher expected return. Now, to be very clear about that, often students get that idea a little bit backwards and they think that what I'm saying is that if you take higher risk, you will get a higher return. That's not what that idea is. What, what we're really saying is that in order to decide to take a higher risk, you should feel that the expected return is higher because obviously if you were offered two equal expected returns over a year, but one involved taking a lot of risk and the other didn't involve much risk, uh, any sensible investor would take the low risk option. So the only reason an investor takes additional risk is in order to, to hopefully reap a higher return. Now, equally, the nature of risk is that maybe they will not get that return. So, Anyhow, let's move on to credit spread. So a credit spread is the yield spread or the difference in yield between two securities that have different credit quality. So essentially what we're saying is that if we have a risky bond and a risk-free bond, we would expect the risky bond to pay more interest, to have a higher yield. And the difference between those two yields is what we call the credit spread. Now, the credit spread of a security is often quoted in relation to the yield on a credit risk-free benchmark. So usually that'll be some sort of government bond. And there are several different measures of credit spread, including things like Z-spread and option-adjusted spread. So there's a lot more detail I could go into on credit spread, but that's really more for a fixed income class. And hopefully you guys know a lot of that stuff already. Um, so then we'll move on to another fundamental concept of finance or a, a fundamental idea within the area of interest rates is that as interest rates go up, bond prices go down. And as interest rates fall, 
bond prices rise. So they have an inverse relationship. And hopefully this makes sense to you. The reason for this is quite simply that if a bond exists, we'll say if there's already a bond out there and it's yielding 4%, because 4% is the going interest rate for that company at that point in time. And in the next week, for a variety of factors, the central bank increases the interest rate that they're paying. So now, if your company were to borrow, they would have to pay 5% rather than 4% on their bonds. What will have to happen is that in order for that 4% bond that you issued a week ago, in order for someone to buy it from the person who currently owns it, the person who currently owns it would have to discount the bond. They'd have to sell it at less than par value at a discount that means that the buyer of that bond gets an effective interest rate of 5%. So thus, as interest rates go up, bond prices fall. And equally, if interest rates fall, suddenly there's a lot more demand for that higher than average yielding bond now. And you would expect bond prices, and by that I mean existing bond prices, to rise. So that's the relationship between bond prices and interest rates. So now we move on to talk about interest rates and the different types of rates. So there are sovereign rates. Often people talk about the US Treasury rate, but it can really be any big country's uh, government bond rate. The treasury rate or the sovereign rate is the rate that a government can borrow at. It's referred to as the treasury rate in the United States, but in, in other countries it has usually a different name. Um, it's usually assumed that a government will not default on a loan on its own currency, as it can quite simply print currency to pay off that bond. Equally, it's able to raise taxes in order to pay off that bond. So usually... Uh, the sovereign rate is considered risk-free. Um, once in a while, there are countries that have defaulted historically on their sovereign bonds, but it, it does not happen very often. The next rate we're going to look at is LIBOR. And LIBOR stands for the London Interbank Offered Rate, and it's the interest rate that large international banks lend to each other at. It's the primary benchmark for short-term rates around the world. LIBOR rates are calculated for five currencies and seven borrowing periods, which range from overnight to one year. And the rates are usually published every day. LIBOR is a high-grade institutional rate. Usually that interest rate will be higher than the sovereign than the treasury rate, simply because it's riskier. The, the rate that banks lend to each other at there's more risk in, in that than there is in, uh, in lending money to a sovereign government. Then we move on to the repo rate. And repo is short for repurchase or repurchase agreement. And so repos are short-term agreements to sell and repurchase securities at a specified rate. Um, it's a type of borrowing where high-grade securities are deposited as collateral. So what's really happening with repo is that one investor wants to borrow overnight and they deposit securities, it could be stocks or bonds or anything, but high-quality securities are deposited with the person that they're borrowing the money from. And they, they give them to that uh, counterparty, agreeing to buy them back at a slightly higher rate the next day. And that slightly higher rate incorporates an interest rate. And so usually when we talk about the repo rate, we're talking about overnight borrow. There are longer versions of that. So uh, arrangements, repo arrangements that are for more than a night are known as term repo. And the repo rate is usually only slightly higher than the sovereign rate. And this is because it's considered extremely low credit risk. And that's because of the collateral. So should the borrower find themselves unable to, to pay the next day, 
that collateral can then be sold in the market and uh, hopefully the lender will come out, if not whole, very close to whole on the arrangement. And so all of this brings us to the concept of the risk-free rate. And we hear a lot about the risk-free rate in finance. And technically, there's no such thing as a risk-free rate because there's no such thing as return without risk. And even the safest investment carries some sort of risk. But most sovereign or government risks are usually referred to as risk-free, particularly when their obligations are in the same currency that they raise revenues through taxes in and equally in a currency that they are able to print. So even in a worst case scenario, if they find themselves unable to tax and raise money to pay off a bond, they can print currency and pay off a bond. And so in this case, we think of the risk as being so low as to be negligible. So usually when we talk about the risk-free rate, we're usually talking about short-term government bonds uh, in, that are issued in the same currency that the country in question uh, raises revenues in. So that was kind of a little catch up on interest rates and terminologies that we use. Um, our next slide is on compounding. And this is just a reminder. Hopefully most of you guys know all of this stuff already. But there's different ways of compounding. So if you put $100 in a bank account at a 5% interest rate, it'll compound as follows. If it's annually, you just take 100 and multiply it by 1.05, and that gives you $105, and that's how much you'll get at the end of the year. If it compounds semi-annually, that'll be 100 times 1.025 times 1.025, and that gives you 1.0506, so it's a little bit more. Quarterly compounded, we get 105.09, and continuously compounded, we get 105.13. And we've talked a lot about continuous compounding up until now, and that is what we, we do in this class for most of our derivatives calculations. We we are using the continuous compounding calculation. So then we'll move on to zero coupon bonds. And zero coupon bonds, we mentioned them, I think, last week um, when we were talking about structured products, but zero coupon bonds are bonds that pay no coupons during their life, but then pay both principal and interest at maturity. So you don't receive occasional interest rate payments at all over the life of the bond. You just receive a lump sum back at the end, that is the money you invested plus the interest that you earned. So if you invest $100 in a five-year zero coupon bond, where the five-year zero coupon interest rate is 5%, at the end of five years, you would receive a lump sum payment of $128.40. And you can see the calculation at the bottom there for how we've calculated that. And so that is what a zero coupon bond is. And that brings us al along now to our next derivative, because we, we needed to sort of uh, review that material in order to, to properly explain our first interest rate derivative. And it is referred to as a forward rate agreement, also known as an FRA. And so, firstly, let's see what a forward rate is. Forward rates are the interest rates that are implied by zero coupon bonds for periods of time in the future. So a forward rate is the expected interest rate, we'll say, for some point in the future. And we back out these forward rates from interest rates that we're able to observe in the market. So here's an example. If there's a two-year loan that's paying 3%, that would be calculated as 100e to the 3% times two years. That gives us 106.18. Now, we could think of that as a two-year loan or as being two one-year loans. So it could be a one-year loan and then another one straight after that. Now, if we know that the one-year interest rate is 2.4%, we can then back out of that what uh, 
the implied interest rate is for one year in one year's time. So in our example, which is worked out in greater detail in the book, you can see here that if you instead viewed it as two one-year loans, we would, and we know that the one-year interest rate is 2.4%, we can see that a two-year loan happens at 3%. We're then able to back out that in order to break even, a one-year loan in one year's time must have an interest rate of 3.6%. So if we look at the calculation, 100 e to the 2.4% times 1, e to the 3.6% times 1 gives us 106.18. So that means that once we know the two-year interest rate and the one-year interest rate, these are two interest rates that we can observe in the market, we're able to, using this formula, back out the one-year interest rate that the market is implying will be in place in one year's time. And so we refer to that as the forward rate. So RF is a forward rate for year ended one to two. So if R1 equals 2.4%, R2 has to equal 3.6% in order to give us a total return of 3% over that two-year period. Hopefully that makes sense to you. So then a forward rate agreement is quite simply an over-the-counter agreement to either borrow or lend during a specified time period not starting now. So if we look at our slide, there's a little diagram there. And our forward rate agreement is, we'll, we'll, we'll say if it's to lend, our forward rate agreement would be to lend from T1 to T2. Now we know the interest rate uh, for a bond that, that is a two-year bond from T0 to T2. And we also know the, the interest rate, the one-year interest rate, so we can back out from that a reasonable rate to borrow or lend at for a period of time not starting now. And so that is referred to as a forward rate agreement. Now, that is an implied interest rate. That is the interest rate that, it, that the market prices are implying will be in place in one year's time. Now, in the real world, things will happen to change that. So rates in the future will often realize differently than at the time you enter into a forward rate agreement. Therefore, that will either generate a profit or a loss for you over the time that you hold it. So if market LIBOR rates in the time one to time two period are higher or lower than those fixed in the FRA, you're going to show a profit or a loss based upon that. Um, so here's an example. You agree to lend $100 million to someone for six months starting in two years' time to earn 3.5%. So that 3.5% is a rate that you'll have backed out of interest rates that are observable in the market, and that will seem like the fair lending rate at the time that you enter this agreement. Now, after two years, you'll be able to look in the market and see actually what the six-month interest rate is. And in this example, we go and look in the at the market and we're able to see that the rate for the next six months is actually 4%. Now, unfortunately for us, we have agreed to lend at three and a half percent for the next six months. So we have to make that loan and we're earning a half of a percent less on that loan than we would have had we not entered that agreement. So we're down on this trade. This is a money losing trade for us. So your cash flows will then be at the end of two and a half years, a hundred million times three and a half percent minus four percent times 0.5 because it's half a year and that's 250,000. So in this example, we've lost 250,000 uh, because the market realized a higher interest rate than was implied two years ago when we agreed to enter 
this derivative agreement. So that is a forward rate agreement. Um, so now we're going to move on to swaps, and swaps are a very big derivative. And um, let's take a look at what they are. So a swap is a derivative in which two counterparties exchange cash flows of one party's financial instrument for those of the other party's financial instrument. So swaps, actually, if you, if you read this definition, you can see that they're not really an awfully complicated derivative. We've basically got two cash flows, and we've decided to exchange one for another. And often students have a hard time with swaps, and they view them as quite a complex derivative. But they're really a lot simpler than a lot of the options we've looked at up until now. One way I like to explain them to students is if uh, we'll imagine if you are sitting with your best friend and you decide that your best friend is very smart and talented and is going to have a great career and your, your friend thinks the same of you and you, you enter into an agreement with your friend and you say, well, I believe so much in you that I want to enter an agreement where we'll both go out and we'll get jobs and we'll work hard. And what will happen is that each of your paychecks that you receive, you'll sign over to me and I'll sign all of my paychecks over to you for the next two years. And, and because I believe in you so much, I think that I'll actually win on that trade. I think that you'll do better than me. That's a swap. A swap is that simple. Only instead of it being with something like paychecks, it's usually with two different interest rates or, well, there's, there's many products that, as you'll see, that we're able to swap. So let's move ahead and we'll look at mortgage rates as an example. So there's two types of mortgage rates available usually to, to people who wish to borrow to buy a home. You can borrow often at a fixed rate or you can borrow at a floating rate, a rate that changes all the time. Now, in our example here, we've got the fixed rate as 4.5% and the floating rate at 4%. Now, people who don't know very much about finance might look at that and say, well, it's obvious that you should borrow at 4% because that's a lower rate than 4.5%. But that's a floating 4%, and over, we'll say, the 30 years of a mortgage, that rate could go up, could go down, all sorts of things can happen with it. So a bank is going to make these loans, we'll say, and a bank typically, at least a, a very traditional bank, takes in its money in form of deposits from customers. So all of these people come, they deposit their money at the bank, and the bank then takes that money and lends it out to people to buy homes with as mortgages. Now, the problem with that is usually a bank is paying a floating rate on that money that they've taken in. The interest you receive on your bank account is usually a floating rate. Now, if the bank wants to make a fixed rate mortgage, if they want to lend the money to you at four and a half percent, they have to worry about what would happen if interest rates moved and that turned into a loss making transaction for them. If they found that they had to keep paying higher and higher rates to their depositors in order to keep the money, but they've lent it out at four and a half percent. So a swap comes in very useful for a bank that wants to make loans like that. So the most commonly known swap is a plain vanilla swap, and its purpose is really just to change mortgage payments from fixed to floating or vice versa. So fixed and floating mortgages should have identical present values. If you can calculate the net present value of each cash flow stream, the correct fixed rate is the rate at which the two cash flows are equal. So usually a swap then will be valued at zero at inception. So it, we work out the fixed rate that makes the swap worth nothing at inception, worth zero. It's a, it's a fair exchange. Um, in order for it to be valued at zero at inception, the present value of the cash flows of each of our two streams has to be equal. Um, so a plain vanilla interest rate swap is one in which one counterparty agrees to pay 
fixed to pay a fixed rate on a notional principle for a fixed number of years. And the other counterparty agrees to pay a floating rate on the same notional principle for the same period of time. The floating leg is usually going to refer to some floating rate, and in the real world usually it's LIBOR, at least right now swaps will usually reference LIBOR, and it might be LIBOR plus some fixed percentage premium above it. So we'll say if there's two companies, ABC and XYZ, and they agree to an interest rate swap, ABC agrees to pay fixed of 4%, and XYZ agrees to pay floating at LIBOR. There's a notional principle of 100 million. The payments will be semi-annual, and the maturity will be in three years. So the first thing we do in order to understand this swap is we draw the little diagram that you'll see there um, on the notes. So we, we draw these two little boxes. We write XYZ and ABC in them, and we draw our arrows. So ABC is paying 4% fixed, and XYZ is receiving that 4% fixed and paying six-month LIBOR. So ABC pays fixed, and XYZ pays floating. The notional principle is 100 million. There are semi-annual cash flows, um, and the maturity is three years. So when we start, when they agree to this, it's a fair trade between them. The two streams of cash flow are of equal value. So we don't really know who's going to win, who's going to make money on this transaction, because we don't know the path that LIBOR rates will take over the next three years. What we do know is that there are six cash flow exchanges at each point. We know that ABC is going to be paying $2 million to XYZ. And then the big question is, what will XYZ be paying back to ABC? So for our example, we, we imagine that we gap forward in time and we'll get to see what actually happened. So we have here a chart, it's figure 15.5 from your textbook, and we have the various periods, there are six periods, and we have in there um, realized LIBOR rates, so what LIBOR actually was at for each of those periods, and then we're able to calculate what the floating cash flows were. So for the first period, we just take 100 million, multiplied by 3.2% over two, that gives us 1.6 million. For the next period, it was 1.85, then 2.1, 2.2, 2.25, and 2.4 million. So that will be the floating cash flow. And then the fixed cash flow we knew from the start was going to be 2 million in each period. Then in our final column, we're able to see the net cash flows exchange. So it's minus 0.4 million, minus 0.15 million, then 0.1 million, 0.2 million, 0.25 million, and 0.4 million. So only at the end of, uh, of the swap do we really know which of the two counterparties will have made money on the transaction. So as you can see there, a swap is not really an awfully complicated idea. It's simply this exchange of two cash flows. Usually one of them is a cash flow that we know, such as the fixed cash flow in that example, and the other is an unknown cash flow, in, in our example, a floating interest rate. And as we move on, we're going to look at a lot of different types of swaps, but they'll all essentially fit into the, the same idea there, where there are two cash flows. It doesn't really matter what they are. They, they have an equal present value at inception, and each counterparty agrees to exchange one for the other. Now, on our next slide, we have swap notionals, and this is an important point, is that the notional principle here, in our example, it was 100 million, doesn't change hand at any point between the two parties. So it's really just the number that we need in order to calculate the size of the payments. Because when we're saying that one is paying 4% fixed, you know, you have to ask, well, 4% of what? And the answer is 4% of the notional principle, which was 
a hundred million dollars. And so it is just a figure on which the individual interest rate calculations are based upon. So with the, the interest rate swap that we just looked at, you can see that what this does, it is it allows these two counterparties to essentially convert one type of loan into another. So ABC switched its borrowing from floating to fixed, and XYZ switched its borrowing from fixed to floating. If, if we assume that they each had a loan in place to begin with, they were able to convert one to the other. Now, that's often what swaps like this are used for, but equally they can be simply used in order to speculate on interest rates rising or falling. So in our example, ABC, when they switched from floating to fixed, that implies that they were concerned that interest rates might rise, and equally XYZ might have been concerned that interest rates will fall. So they were either hedging a position and converting from fixed to floating or from floating to fixed, or they might have been speculating on interest rates rising or falling over that period. Now, usually swaps are not really arranged just between two counterparties, as we just showed, uh, simply because it would be difficult for, we'll say, two large corporates to find each other and to agree to a swap like that. So what usually happens is that there's an investment bank somewhere in the middle, and the investment bank will usually trade with each of the counterparties, and they will be a middleman. Their goal will not really be to be exposed to the risk of the swap. They will be aiming just to charge a fee. So when we move on to this slide that's called market making for swaps, you can see here that we put an investment bank in there in the middle. And ABC is now paying 4.1% fixed. And then XYZ is receiving 3.9% fixed. So the investment bank sitting in the middle, um, the swap broker, is charging a fee or a spread to their clients. And that is the profit that they take. Now, it's not all profit. Obviously, the investment bank might be exposed to risk in that they uh, might have agreed to the swap with ABC first and had to spend a day finding uh, another counterparty like XYZ who is willing to take the other side of it. And so they there will be a profit built into that, but often there also is some risk exposure that the bank will face if they have mismatched entry timing to each leg of the swap. So our next slide, why enter into swap? So there's a few reasons. One is just that you have a belief that you know the direction that the interest rate is going to go in, that you want to speculate on interest rates either rising or falling. And the other reason you might enter into swaps is simply to convert your assets or liabilities from one to another. And as we move on and we'll see different types of swaps, hopefully you'll be able to understand why people might choose to enter into one swap or another. So valuation of swaps. So as we've said, they're usually valued at zero at inception. So usually the two cash flows will have identical present values to start with, and therefore the value will be zero at inception. So neither counterparty has to pay the other uh, to, to enter into the swap. But once the swap is in existence, interest rates might move, for example, and so suddenly the swap will take on a positive value to one leg and a negative value on the other leg. So for example, if you are receiving fixed, the value of the swap is quite simply the present value of fixed cash flows minus the present value of floating cash flows. If you're receiving floating, the value of a swap is the present value of floating cash flows minus the present value of fixed cash flows. So as you can see, there's not really a huge complicated formula here. It's nothing like the Black-Scholes formula, binomial trees or anything like that. It's really just that you have to present value the, the two cash flows at that point in future. And odds are 
they will have changed. The present values will have changed because the interest rates will have changed over the life of the swap. And that tells you uh, the value of the swap. And it may have a positive or a negative value, um, depending on which side of the swap you're on. So that's probably the, the easiest way to value a swap as the present value of floating rate and fixed rate bonds. And another method that we can use is to value the swap as a portfolio of FRAs or forward rate agreements. Um, so let's look at an example now. A swap has been in existence for some time and we want to value it. And here are the details of the swap. It's a pay floating swap where you're paying six month LIBOR versus 5% fixed. So you're receiving fixed paying floating um, with semi-annual payments. The notional amount is $100 million. There's one and three quarters of a year remaining on the swap. Continuously compounded LIBOR for three months is 6%, nine months is 6.5%. Uh, for 15 months is 7%, and for 21 months is 7.3%. Six-month LIBOR at the last payment date was 6.2%. What is the value of the swap? So this is, this is the problem that we're going to settle. Now, uh, a feature that we should point out here, when we have here that six-month LIBOR at the last payment date was 6.2%, you might ask yourself, well, why do we care about that? Well, the reason that that's in there is because usually for a swap, the, um, the, the floating rate is fixed at the last payment date. So there's usually a lag. So whenever a payment is made, um, LIBOR is observed then and there, and the next payment is agreed upon in advance. So we're always paying the prior six month LIBOR rate. And so that's why we need to know that in order to answer this question. So let's see how it goes. So the first thing we're going to look at here is swap valuation using bond value. So this is figure 15.8 in your book. So all we do is we, we build up this table and we've got the payment period, three months, nine months, 15 months, and 21 months. And we can put in the fixed bond cash flow. So it's two and a half million, two and a half million, two and a half million. And then we put in 102.5 million because we're pricing this like a bond. So that's principal and interest. Then we look at the floating bond value. So that is a hundred million plus 100 million times 6.2% divided by 2, and that gives us 103.1 million. We then discount these using the present valuing factor. So E to the 6% times 3 over 12 for 3 months uh, equals 0.9851. So that's, that's from our, uh, we, we've taken that 6%. We said LIBOR continuously compounded is 6%, 6.5, 7, and 7.3 for the three month, nine month, 15, and 21 month period. So we, we simply run each of those percentages through that formula in order to get our discount factors. And we've got 0 0.9851, 0 0.9524, 0 0.9162 and 0.8801. And those are our discount factors. So then we take our bond cash flows and we multiply them by those discount factors and we get 2.4628 million, 2.3810 million, 2.2905 million, and 90.2075 million. We sum them all up and we've got 97.3419 million. Now, on the present value of the floating bond, we simply present value that 103.1 million by multiplying it by that discount factor. And we've got 101.5650 million. And so then we're able to, to say that the received fixed value swap is equal to the fixed rate bond minus the floating rate bond. So that is 97.3419 million 
minus 101.565 million, which is minus 4.22 million. So that is the value of the swap. And obviously the opposing counterparty has the exact opposite value. Now, let's look a little bit more at this in case some of you are confused. Um, when we were calculating the value of the fixed cash flows, it's probably quite obvious to you what was happening because we had 5% fixed. And so that's two and a half million being paid at each point. And then finally, 102.5 million. And we present valued all of those. On the floating front, all we did was we looked at that 6.2% and we, we calculated that at 103.1 million present value that and said that was the value of the, the floating bond. And sometimes students say to me, well, why don't we have all of the other parts of the floating rate bond in there, each additional interest rate? Well, the thing about that is that all of the other payments are a floating rate being discounted at a floating rate. So they actually just cancel each other out. So pricing our floating rate bond really just involves looking at that 6.2%, which was six month LIBOR at the last payment date. And we just, that's the only figure we needed to know in order to present value our floating rate bond. And so once we've present valued each of these two bonds, we then just have to look at the different values between the two of them. And that is what our swap's worth. So it's not awfully complicated. Now, as I said, that is figure 15.8 in your textbook. And if you go back through your textbook, that example is worked out in detail. So if you have any confusion, you know, please just take a look at it in the chapter in your textbook. So on our next slide, then we have the FRA method for pricing the swap. And, uh, you know, it's really, you just really need to learn one of these two methods. Some people like one, other people like the other. But um, as you can see here, we come to the same value. So we've got here time, three months, nine months, 15 months, 21 months. We've then got the fixed cash flows in there. We've got the FRA calculation here continuously compounded. So we've got 6.5% times 0.75 minus 6% times 0.25. And that's all divided by 0.5. And that gives us 6.75%. So we do similar calculations for the 15 month and the 21 months. Um, and then we continue on. We've got two times the square root of e to the 6.75%, which we just calculated, minus one, equals 6.87%. And we do the same calculation for the 15 and 21 months. That calculates our floating cash flows times our discount factor and then we just look at the difference between the cash flows there. So we've got the present value of the net cash flows there. And when we sum those all up, we come to minus 4.2232 million, which is the same number that we calculated on the last slide. So it's really just two methods to do the same thing. And it really a lot just depends on which method um, you find easiest. And once again, each the, the opposing counterparty will have the opposite value because they have the opposite cash flows to a party whose side we have calculated. So that is swaps and, and swap valuation. And as you can see, it's not really very complicated. It's simply, it's simply the present value of two streams of cash flows and looking at the difference between them. And that is the value of our swap. So currency swaps is on our next slide. That's what we're moving on to. And the whole purpose of a currency swap is to allow people to transform the currency in which they are borrowing into a different one. So what happens with a currency swap is we exchange principal and interest payments in one currency for principal and interest payments in another currency. So once again, it's really, it's just two cash flows 
that we're exchanging. But in this case, the, the variable, instead of one being floating and one being fixed, it's just that these two cash flows are in different currencies. The principal amounts are exchanged at the beginning and again at the end of this swap. Now, the reason for that is because we're trying to transform the borrowing currency. So with our plain vanilla swap that we looked at a moment ago, I said that the notional principal doesn't get exchanged. And the reason for that is it would be silly for one person to write a $100 million check to another and to, to receive a $100 million check. There, there's no point to that. But when we're trying to convert borrowing currencies, it makes sense to exchange the currency at the beginning and again at the end of the swap. So the principal amounts are chosen to be equal given the exchange rate at the inception of the swap. And so once again, the valuation to start with is typically zero. So no one has to make a payment to anyone else. We, we just find a foreign exchange rate that is fair for both parties. So on our next slide, we have a fixed for fixed foreign exchange swap being valued using two bonds or a portfolio of forward contracts. So the bond valuation method, if the swap is local currency being received, the value of the swap is BD minus S0 times BF. So BD is the bond value with domestic cash flows. And BF is the foreign price bond with foreign cash flows, and S0 is the exchange rate. So it's so in order to value this swap, it is the bond value with domestic cash flows minus the exchange rate times the foreign price bond with foreign cash flows. So once again, not a very complicated formula to price a currency swap. The next swap that we'll look at is an equity swap, and it's quite simply an agreement to exchange the total returns, which are dividends and capital gains, for an equity or a, an equity index in exchange for a fixed or a floating rate of interest. So an example would be if one party was exchanging the total return on a basket of S&P 500 stocks for LIBOR. And this obviously gives someone, if you were a fund manager who had a large portfolio of stocks and you entered into this swap, you would essentially be converting your portfolio of stocks into a portfolio of bonds that pays LIBOR, for example. So that is an equity swap. Other swaps that are out there include things like commodity swaps, volatility swaps, dividend swaps. There are even options on swaps or options embedded in swaps. So a swap might be extendable, meaning that one party has the right to extend the life of the swap. It might be puttable, meaning that one party has the right to terminate the swap early if it's favorable to do so. And there's even things that are called swaptions, which is the right in future to enter into a swap where predetermined fixed rate is exchanged for floating. So that is a swaption. So that's us done with swaps and we're on to the last piece of the class which is credit derivatives. Okay so that is swaps and now we're going to move on to credit derivative or our last group of derivatives for this class and the first credit derivatives we're going to look at are credit default swaps which are sort of a, a swap as well. So the first thing we'll talk about is what is credit risk and we've already explained what credit spread earlier is and so our credit risk is an investor's risk of loss arising from a borrower who does not make payments as promised. And such an event is usually called the default, and therefore people refer to credit risk sometimes as default risk or counterparty risk, but essentially they're all the same thing. So a credit default swap then is a financial swap agreement that the seller of the CDS will compensate the buyer in the event of a loan default or other credit event. The CDS buyer makes a series of payments, which we call the CDS fee or the CDS spread, to the seller and in exchange receives a payoff if the loan defaults. So this is an awful lot like 
insuring your bond. Now, the thing that's interesting about CDS is you don't actually need to own a bond in order to buy insurance on it or, or to buy CDS on it. And this is slightly controversial. So anyhow, when a company does go bankrupt, typically they don't go all the way to zero. Everything isn't wiped out. There's usually some recovery. Assets can be sold off and so on. Historically, that's been 30 to 40% of the face value of the bonds that are recovered. So CDS buyers receive notional minus recovery. Um, so CDS can be used to hedge a portfolio's bond holdings. And if an investor is owns bonds, is long bonds, they can also buy CDS protection. So we'll say, for example, if you owned a bond and it was paying at 7% a year, the C- and the CDS cost 200 basis points per year, um, once you've bought that CDS protection, you're effectively left with a riskless bond yielding 5% a year. And so that kind of implies to you what the cost of CDS should be. The CDS spread should roughly be the same as the credit spread on a bond, because if you were able to buy it for less, you'd be able to get a risk-free bond for for a higher interest rate than the risk-free rate of return, which doesn't make sense. So usually you would expect the CDS spread to be roughly the same as the credit spread on the bond in question. Um, So regulatory pressure has increased on CDS uh, to trade them in a more transparent manner. People are pushing to see them traded on exchange and to clear through clearing houses in order to improve the market for investors. And that is CDS. And if you're interested in them, you can read up a bit more in the book on that topic. And now our next derivative, our next credit derivative is a CDO or collateralized debt obligation. And so CDOs are asset-backed securities where the underlying assets are bonds. And how it works is that we take a portfolio of bonds and the risks of losses on the entire portfolio are carved up and sold to different investor classes. So a CDO is made up of tranches, which is the French word for slice. So slices, which deliver the cash flows from interest and principal payments from the pool of bonds in sequence based upon seniority. If some bonds default and the cash collected by the CDO is not sufficient to pay all of the investors, those in the lowest or most junior tranches are allocated the losses first. The last tranche to suffer losses from default are the safest and most senior tranches of the CDO. So the whole purpose of this really is to take average quality bonds and split up the risk such that some investors can receive a triple A type bond and other investors take on a lot of the risk of that portfolio of bonds. And so essentially you're taking the risks of a portfolio of bonds and allocating them to investors who desire different levels of risk from their bond portfolio. Now, as you can see on our next slide, uh, figure 17.2 from your textbook, Credit ratings and interest vary by tranche with the safest ones paying the lowest rates and the riskiest ones paying the highest rates. So here we've got our pool of collateral and the cash that comes from that collateral gets paid into these different tranches. And so the riskiest tranches are the ones that are going to have the highest default rate. And then the most senior tranche uh, will probably be rated triple A and should be the last group to suffer losses. Um, So quite simply, a CDO is a promise to pay cash flows to investors in a prescribed sequence based on how much cash flow the CDO collects from the pool of bonds or other assets that it owns. If the cash is insufficient to pay all of its investors, those in the lower layers suffer losses first. So CDOs historically were structured or compiled with bonds that made the top tranches be rated AAA. So, and that, that's really just that there's 
a lot of demand for AAA for high quality bond. Bond investors generally tend to like security. And so there was a lot of demand for these AAA bonds. So highly rated bonds were created from baskets of relatively poorly rated bonds through this approach, through this partitioning of risk and different levels of loss bearing buckets. CDOs in pre-credit crisis, because obviously we can't talk about CDOs without talking about the credit crunch, CDO returns at the time were 2 to 3% greater than corporate bonds with the same credit rating. And so that should, to a certain extent, tell you that there were greater risks in there than that AAA credit risk or credit rating was telling you. At the time, there were very low global interest rates. And bond investors were frustrated that if they were going to buy secure bonds, they weren't really earning much in interest. So they turned to these CDOs, which seemed to give them the security of a AAA bond, but with 2 to 3% greater coupons. Um, U.S. mortgage CDOs were seemed to be an attractive investment to many bond investors um, who were searching for yield. Now, during the financial crisis, a lot of these CDOs, these AAA CDOs, which were meant to be extremely secure, went bust. And the reason for that was that there was a very high correlation between the different risks within the portfolio. So when the, when the bonds, the, the securities within the CDO went bust, it's not that they went bust one by one in a random kind of manner, but they actually all fell apart at the same time. So the CDO, to a certain extent, was disgraced during the, the credit crunch. And as you can see from the chart on our last slide, that after the credit crunch, there was a huge fall off in asset-backed security issuance, and the CDO has almost completely disappeared. It's, it's coming back a little bit. So this is a security that was a very big product back in, you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, and has become a rather niche security nowadays because uh, many investors were really burned by them. And the CDO, a lot of lessons will have been learned from, from the financial crisis. And the CDO will never probably come back to be as big a product as it was back in the early 2000s. But there are still lots of ideas in there about breaking up risks and allocating risks to different investor bases that are kind of interesting and that will probably continue on in the derivatives markets in the coming years. So now we've reached the end of class number six. And this is our last lecture. So thank you very much for attending our online classes.